um, continue to pray for Jerry. Um, she, um, I don't know if you know who Jerry is or not, but she's the sweet little old lady. She's the cake, um, the cake Nazi lady that makes you eat dinner before you have cake. But um, she had a serious fall and was hospitalized for a number of days. And now she's recuperating at home. So um, mm -hmm. a serious fall and just pray that uh, God restores her. And then tomorrow um, we're going to, um, to see Franklin Graham. I don't know if you guys were listening to um, WMUZ this afternoon, but Bob Duco interviewed Franklin Graham and um, talked to him about uh, um, his, uh, the need for people just to know Christ. And when they know Christ, they don't live the, the sinner's life, and they don't go to hell. They live the better life. And um, it was just encouraging to hear them. Um, Billy Graham, the Evangelistic Association, and um, their division, Samaritan's Purse, they already have semi-trucks on the way to Florida to help those affected by Hurricane Ian. They do a lot of work. Um, They've uh, sent plane load after plane load after plane load, cargo plane loads of stuff to um, to the Ukraine to help um, to help people in the Ukraine, and also they sent stuff to Poland to help the people of Ukraine who are fleeing to Poland. So um, all those countries, Russia, Ukraine, and Poland, they're all borders. They border each other, so close together and. Um, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, even though Billy Graham died um, in 2017, um, his son Franklin has picked up the, the baton and continues to carry it forward. And tomorrow he's going to be in Flint, Michigan, and it'll be good to see him tomorrow in Flint, Michigan. So um, he'll have a, a wonderful message. And hearing him on the phone, he's got the same, almost the same voice as his dad. It's almost a little scary. <laughs> He oh, sounds he, a lot like his dad. Like What's that? He looks a lot like the old man. Yeah, uh, you can't you can't deny that one. <laughs> and um, um, he has a son named Will that looks like him, like him too. So now the grandson's preaching as well. And um, so you know the the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And um, anyways, it's just good to see how um, the whole family is. Um, has been involved in ministry, never any scandals, never, I mean, they get a lot of slack. He's been uninvited to the White House and under the, the current regime. Um, but his father, I think, um, Billy said that he either, um, um, uh, I think it was 16 or 17 <coughs> presidents that um, Billy Graham personally ministered to. So quite a legacy. I mean, on both sides, I mean, over the period of time, um, not just one, one, one group of presidents, but ministered to both sides. Today, um, I want to talk about playing with fire, and um, can we still believe in hell? <laughs> is my message. Um, a few weeks back, I started talking about um, the topic of death. Um, we were in the book of Job for a minute, and then um, the last few weeks, I've been talking about what happens when you die. Um, a couple weeks ago, we talked about um, death and reincarnation. Um, last week, we talked about purgatory um, and, and death. And tonight is um, a topic on the topic of hell itself. <coughs> and so um, let's just bow our heads and pray. And uh, we pray for travel mercies tomorrow um, on our trip. Um, we're going to Frankenmuth, and then um, we're going to come back south and go to Flint to um, Crossroads Village, and so it's going to be a busy, fun day, and uh, uh, I got like three things on my schedule for tomorrow, so I don't know how they're all going to work out, but somehow they're going to work out. Um, uh, so we just pray that uh, we'll have travel mercies, but let's bow our heads. Uh, gracious Father, we just lift Jerry up to you. Father, we thank you for Jerry. We thank you for her kindness to us and her her unending faith and her faithfulness to this church. We thank you for all the cakes that she's made and all the things that she's done. I mean, even at her advanced age, um, she's involved in so many different things. She's always involved in our rum at sales and she's involved in our um, food, food ministry. She, she just 
has a love for um, the things that we do. But Lord, now we lift her up. We lift her up uh, from uh, her current condition. We pray for restoration. We pray for healing. We pray that you would continue to, to help her in her recovery. Bless her even now, Lord. And Father, I join my voice, hopefully with many other voices, and we cry out to heaven, Lord, that you would touch her and that you would heal her and make her whole. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing and already doing. Father, we pray for um, <clears throat> our evangelistic trip tomorrow to Flint and to Frankenmuth. <clears throat> we pray over, our, we pray for travel mercies back and forth. Father, just protect us and lead us and guide us and direct us. Um, and do the same for Franklin Graham. Because <clears throat> after Michigan, Franklin Graham goes on to Wisconsin and then to Minnesota. So we just pray, Lord, that um, Franklin Graham, who, who, came from, uh, who came from North Carolina all the way up to Pennsylvania, then to Ohio, now to Michigan, we thank you for him selecting our state as one of the states to, to, to bring the message of hope, the message of the gospel, and the message of Jesus to and that he will proclaim tomorrow in an effective way that God really does love each of us. God loves you. This is the God Loves You Tour. So, Lord, we just praise you and thank you for their ministry. We praise and thank you for what they're doing, um, the whole thing. And uh, bless the newsboys as they minister in music, uh, the other groups that are going to minister in music. And um, <clears throat> may many hearts be touched, Lord. We just pray that hearts would be opened to the gospel, hearts would be touched by the gospel, and that you would move mightily tomorrow, Lord. Father, I pray also that you would bless the word tonight, that you would help us with wisdom and understanding, that you would give us understanding of your precious word. Help us, Lord Jesus, open our hearts to receive what you would have for each of us. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Like I said, I'm talking about hell tonight, playing with fire. Um, is the topic or the, the title of my sermon. But it's easy to get to extremes when it comes to the topic of hell. Either we focus on the lurid descriptions of the damned burning and eternal torment, or people just want to avoid the topic altogether. And earlier generations tended to stress the former, you know, you don't want to go to hell. And... Um, I can tell you today, more and more people are headed that way. <laughs> Just look around, and it's obvious. Uh, you know, in the book of Matthew, it says, wide is the way, narrow is the path that leads to heaven. So if that's true, the opposite is true. And the Bible also says that hell is expanding. There's no need for heaven to expand because there's not that many people going. But it says hell is expanding because... The population there they just need more places for uh, people um, in hell but um, <clears throat> you know like I said um, you know they used to preach fire and brimstone appropriately and um, in in one of his classic sermons sinners in the hands of an angry God Jonathan Edwards offered this description of hell <clears throat> waiting to receive the impenitent sinners it says, the devil is waiting for them, hell is gaping for them, the, f the flames gather and the flash around them, and they will lay hold on them, and all these things will swallow them up. You know, most people, um, they don't want to believe that, ver that version of hell. Um, that's the fire and brimstone, Jonathan Edwards, he's um, long gone, but uh, his sermons are well, well preserved. But uh, he was one of those fire and brimstone kind of preachers. And he goes so far as to describe sinners as being held over the pit of hell as one holds a spider over an open flame. Needless to say, such preaching isn't very popular today. You tell people about hell and they're like, well, that's just a mythical place. It's not real. And as a matter of fact, the whole topic of hell isn't even mentioned very much in church today because... The seeker-friendly churches don't want to talk about hell. They don't want to scare anybody and scare off the dollars that, uh, that uh, those people have in their pockets that they hope they leave in the offering plate. So instead of offending people and telling them the truth about sin and hell and, and such things that the Bible was very clear about, 
they just kind of avoid all those topics. Um, you know, they just want to talk about how God loves you and, you know, the positive message. And they don't uh, teach the whole counsel of God. They only give you parts of the counsel of God. And in, in teaching you parts of the counsel of God and not the whole counsel of God, it leaves a lot of people um, not really developed in their Christian understanding of who God really is and, and what's the intent of, of this life in pre preparation for the next. But as a matter of fact, um, like I say, uh, churches today don't really like to mention it. And even conservative evangelical churches, they, for, they prefer just to focus on God's love and the possibilities of abundant life that God wants to give to us. Um, you know, and um, then you have certain preachers, they, they write books about your best life and, you know, how wonderful everything is and um, just, you know, keep buying our books and tapes and whatever. And, um, you know, we live happily ever after. I don't know about everybody else. But um, they don't they don't really teach the, the full doctrine. But hell has been rightly called the forgotten doctrine of the Christian church. And the reason it's called the forgotten doctrine is people don't like to talk about it because it scares people as it should. And in one sense... It's not altogether bad that it's the forgotten doctrine. You know, I wouldn't care to go to a church where the pastor made hell his favorite topic week after week because um, it's only one topic, and I don't talk about it exceedingly, but it's real. And there would probably be something wrong with a person who um, liked to preach about hell every single week, week after week after week. But, you know, as I, as I look at my own um, heart and, and, and think. I, I don't think there's, there's a, a year that goes by that I don't preach on hell, but I, I don't think it should be preached on every single week. But, um, you know, the, the burden is to, to reach people, but, you know, to give them the, the reality check of hell is real, heaven's real, God is real. Um, and as we found out a couple of weeks ago, um, when we had somebody in the church that disagreed with me, I mean, you know, we have this cancel culture that just shouts you down and doesn't really care. But, you know, um, you know, at harvest time, I think you have to teach the whole counsel of God, the good, the bad, the ugly, the painful, the problem, some, the difficult. And you have to teach people that God does judge people because the Bible does say that um, it's appointed for once for man to die. Then comes the judgment. Well, God does the judging and you're going to go one place or the other. Um, and so, um, you know, I think the fact that, um, that heaven is real and hell is real, I think that sometimes you have to have some, some preaching on it so that we understand what it's all about. But hell is a hard, hard topic to talk about because, you know, um, we probably all know some people that have already gone there. <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, if you want to be honest and real about it, you know, we know that uncle or that friend that was a real devil or that auntie that didn't live a very nice life. And so one of the big reasons why people don't talk about hell is we all know people that have gone there. And so, you know, my goal isn't in this message isn't to convince you of anything. Um, if you do not believe in hell, I doubt anything that I say will change your mind. Some people just think it's a mythical place, but... My only goal is to declare what God says on this particular topic. Not to scare anybody, not to, to shake anybody, rattle anybody's cage or shake them up. You know, I just want you to be clear what God says about this particular topic. And what you do with the truth that God has, that's between you and the Lord. I mean, um, you do with it as, as you see fit. You know, I'm not trying to scare anyone um, from, from hell to heaven or vice versa. Um, and if I could do that, probably I would try, but that's not my objective. But, you know, fear can be a powerful motivation to do right. You know, people really understood the consequences of our sins and how much our God abhors sin itself. We would probably make different choices. We would do things differently. Or we would live our lives differently. But actually, that's not my job. That job is reserved for the Holy Spirit to convict us. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict us of sin and, and really illuminate us. My job is just to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then you can handle that as you see fit. If you truly are a believer in Christ, 
you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the great counselor, is the great teacher, and the Holy Spirit will instruct you further in terms of, of, um, of these things. My, my goal is to just tell you the truth, and then you can deal with it as, as you see fit. But it's sometimes said that the doctrine of hell is kind of a stumbling block to the work of evangelism. You know, if you tell people they're going to hell, they don't want to hear about that. So they'll just, you know, especially in this cancel culture world we live in, you know, don't talk to me. You know, I don't want to hear anything about your God. Um, and, you know, we're told that hell is indefensible. It's obsolete. Hell is out of touch with modern thinking. I've heard all these things from people. You know, they don't want to hear about it. But um, the last point is, is probably um, certainly true. You know, hell is out of touch with modern thinking. Most people think, you know, I'm just going to do whatever I want in this life, and then I'll just, whatever happens in the next life, that's okay, because hell's not real anyways. But in a world where the very concepts of truth is up for grabs, and that's the kind of world we live in, truth is relative. You know, there's no absolute truth. There's no absolute anything. Truth is up for grabs. See, the notion of an eternal hell seems fearfully outdated. I mean, why would you think that hell was real when I can just make things up and believe whatever I want? Um, and I don't really need a God to tell me how I should believe or what I should believe. And, um, you know, I, I think um, that most of us, you know, we would agree that, you know, our culture kind of dictates uh, much more than the Bible does. We don't have a biblical worldview. We don't have a spiritual worldview. You know, we have a worldly worldview, and we look at things from the context of, you know, what the newspapers say and what the politicians say and what our friends say and what the world teaches us. So we have a culture that's just sensitive to the culture itself. But, you know, we have to find ways to say things so that people actually hear the truth. You know, God's word is the truth, and we have to preach the truth whether people appreciate it or not, whether they receive it or not, whether they accept it or not, because it says that even in the Bible that preachers are held to a higher standard. I don't want to get to heaven someday and, you know, God say, well, you didn't really tell them, you know, or, or you sugarcoated it so much they didn't even think hell and heaven were even real, you know. You just talked about God's love every week and never told them about what happens to people that sin and are unrepentant. But this presupposes that, you know, that we will be true to God's word, even when it isn't popular. And, um, you know, I have people get in my face on a regular basis. It happened in public here, like I said a couple of weeks ago, for those of you who were here, you, you heard it and seen it. But people will get in your face when you tell them the truth that they don't like. I mean, they'll shout you down, they'll shout you out, they'll, they'll, they'll do all kinds of things. And... Um, that's just the way it is. I mean, because it isn't popular and it's not comfortable to them, um, you know, um, is that's the way it is. But you know, I got to tell you, it, it, it's not easy. <laughs> it, 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 it's not easy to um, to talk about hell, and but you know, it'd be a lot easier just to say, well, you know, we're not going to talk about that. That's just one of those hard doctrines, and God doesn't send people to hell. And in reality, God doesn't send people to hell. You know, we choose hell for ourselves. When we reject God and we live a sinful life and, um, you know, we do things our way instead of God's way, we send ourselves to hell. God doesn't send anybody to hell. In fact, God has a mechanism to avoid hell. Um, it's called a relationship with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have to embrace that if you want to avoid those fires. But, you know... A lot of people in our church smoke, so I think a lot of people like the smoking section, and they want the smoking section in the next life. I'm not sure, but, you know, I'm just guessing. I think it's funny. You guys, well, John thought it was funny. Okay. But, you know, um, um, instead of avoiding the topic, Jesus felt free to raise the topic of hell. And so if Jesus felt comfortable and free to talk about the topic of hell, if it's a biblical topic, I think the church should talk about it as well. But an interesting thing is a recent poll said that 89% of Americans say they believe in heaven, 
you know, and only 53% believe in hell. So a lot of people think they're a lot better than they really are because, I mean, if 89% of Americans believe in a real heaven, but only like 43% believe that there's a hell, there's pretty much a big division in thinking or a, a problem with thinking. But the interesting fact is that the number of Americans who claim to believe in hell, um, you know, um, is, is such a... Uh, uh, in disparity to the other number of the ones that believe in heaven. And um, it was funny because um, no one knows, you know, um, why people believe what they believe, but a lot of people, they haven't been properly churched. They haven't been churched. They don't, they don't go to church. They don't have good doctrine. They heard this from so-and-so. They heard that from so-and-so. So-and-so might be a Jehovah Witness and told them that and the other one... You know, um, it was funny because I just talked to a lady a couple of days ago and she said, you know, the Mormons, um, you know, were in our, in the South Warren neighborhood all summer long. And she says, you know, the, their Jesus is better than your Jesus. And it's like, well, who's their Jesus? Oh, he's a great prophet. It's like, well, you don't even know Jesus. Not the Jesus of the Bible, not the biblical Jesus. But, you know, I just thought it was interesting, but it's just interesting how some people can be so misled into their thinking, you know, two guys drive by with white shirts, ties, and a um, little name tag on their bikes, and all of a sudden their Jesus is better than the other Jesus. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. And um, this is a person that a number of years ago used to come here for food, but has never come to church, so they don't have any good grounding in terms of what what um, real theology is all about anyways, in my estimation. But, especially based on their comments. But, um, you know, Jesus told us that, uh, the, that broad is the way that leads to destruction, and narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. I alluded to this verse a couple moments ago. That's Matthew 7, 13 and 14. And so... Um, most people, that's where they're going. They're, they're on the way to destruction. That's hell. That's what Jesus is speaking about here in Matthew 7. And narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life with him. And so the majority of people are going to hell. The, the, there, there's, there's some people that are going to heaven, but that's the, the lesser amount. But many on the road to hell don't even know they're on the road to hell. And that's a sad thing because, you know, they eat, drink, and be merry. Um, it's like um, it's like uh, the the wedding feast, you know, where you know um, they got locked out because they weren't ready, and they were locked out. The gate, the doors were never opened. They went. They weren't prepared. You know, the virgins weren't prepared, so. They didn't have oil, so they went to go get prepared. And in the meantime, the doors were closed. Too late for them. And that's definitely a, a parable that, a parable that uh, relates to heaven. But there's only two possibilities um, regarding hell. Either it's real or it isn't. Those are the only two options. If it's real, then, um, you know, um, Larry Dixon's comments are apropos. It says, man is not spiritually neutral. He is on the way to the most horrific place and needs to be rescued. And if hell isn't real, you know, I, I guess um, the atheist friend, um, you know, he doesn't worry about what happens when he dies. Because when you ask an atheist what happens when you die, they tell you nothing. And my grandfather, I would say he was more of an agnostic than an atheist. and But he said, well... When you're dead, you're dead, and that's it. But he made sure we went to church, so I'm not sure, you know, where he was. I talked to him about it many times. He just didn't ever seem to connect the dots. So, um, you know, but when we think about death, you know, our bodies are buried or they're cremated. And, um, you know, an atheist believes that your soul just dissolves into nothingness, who you are, the essence of who you are. But, you know, the question always lingers. I mean, what if an atheist is wrong? Um, but in order that you might know, you know, 
what uh, our church um, believes on this. I mean, we believe that there's there's reward and there's punishment um, for those who live their lives according to either way. You know, and we believe that at the moment of death, um, the unsaved go to hell and um, they're kept under that punishment um, until the final judgment and then after which time they'll suffer um, everlasting punishment separated from the presence of God because hell is really the essence of being separated from God. That's the essence of what hell really is. Mm -hmm. But with that background, um, you know, I, I want to try to answer is, is hell for real? And there's only two ways to answer a question like this. Is hell for real? Um, either we look to human opinions, and there's lots of human opinions. You can find human opinions everywhere. Or we consider what God has said. The most obvious biblical fact is that Jesus believed in hell. I mean, from a biblical perspective, Jesus believed in hell. He spoke about it frequently. You don't have to take my word for it. Read the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, um, and you will discover that Jesus spoke more about hell than he spoke about heaven. In the four Gospels, if you just read them, you would realize that hell is spoken of by Jesus himself fairly often. <clears throat> Much more does he speak about hell than heaven. Most of what we know about hell comes from the words of our Lord. Um, and then add to that fact that the apostles all believed in hell, and the Christian church has always believed in hell. And this is one of those um, rare points. Um, Catholics believe in hell, Protestants believe in hell, Orthodox believe in hell, Evangelicals, they're all in general agreement that there is a physical, literal hell. There's some churches now that are starting to fall from traditional doctrine that, that claim there is no literal hell, but for 2,000 years, Christians have been united in saying that those who die, having rejected Jesus Christ, will spend eternity in hell. That's common amongst almost all Christians, and that's been a common belief since Christ was here more than 2,000 years ago. Some groups have added certain doctrines, as we discussed last week, the doctrine of purgatory, but the basic truth remains that the Christian church has always believed in a literal hell. And the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, offers our best and clearest picture into the nature of hell itself. And because these words come from Jesus himself, we must treat them with utmost respect. Because... Jesus is the Son of God. He speaks with divine authority. He speaks with the authority of the Godhead. So what Jesus says has to be trusted, can be trusted. And I realize that some people refer to this as a parable, but I have no objection as long as they're calling it a parable doesn't mean it's an excuse for ignoring what it says. Because some people, they say, well, that's a parable in the Bible. It's not a true story. So we'll just ignore the truth that belies this parable. And I'm not sure it really is a parable. It doesn't say that it's a parable. Other, other things say specifically they're a parable, but this one doesn't. Jesus does not call the story of the rich man and Lazarus a parable at all. And if it is, it's only a parable in which an actual name of a person is used, Lazarus, it reads like a genuine report of life after death, which is how I think we should treat it. And the story goes like this. I'm not sure if you know the story. I'll, I'll paraphrase the story. I'm not going to read it word for word, but um, the story kind of goes like this. There was a beggar named Lazarus, not the Lazarus who Jesus brought back to life. Um, not that Lazarus. This is a different Lazarus. This was a beggar named Lazarus. He sat at the gate of the rich man, hoping for scraps from his table. He was so poor that the dogs licked his sores. When he died, the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom, a Jewish expression for paradise or heaven. The rich man died, and he went to hell. 
which in the Greek is Hades. And even though his body was buried, the rich man's soul still existed and somehow maintained its sensory perception. In the flames of hell, he saw Abraham and Lazarus far away, and he made a request. Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in the agony in this fire. That's Luke 16.24. And it's kind of a prayer from hell to heaven, from the damned to the redeemed. And Abraham replies that it can't be done. You know, there's no redemption at this point. Between you, you, between us and you, there's a great chasm that's been fixed. So those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. That's Luke 16, 26. See, no one in heaven can cross over to hell, and no one in hell can cross over to heaven. That's clear from this teaching of Jesus in, in Luke 16. Eternal destinies are fixed at the moment of death, and they can't be changed, nor can a situation in hell be alleviated. This guy just wanted one drop of cold water, his finger dipped in cold water because he just needed just a, a few drops or a drop of, of water. Abraham refuses that request, saying that they should read Moses and the prophets, Deeply concerned for his brothers, the rich man declares that, that they will believe if somebody comes to them from the dead and, and tells them what the final outcome of life is. You know what this answer is? Still, it's no. You know, if they won't believe what the prophets have written, they won't be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. End of story. So, this guy who ended up in heaven, this rich guy, he's like, if, if there's nothing that could be done for me, at least warn my brothers so they don't end in the same position. And Abraham says, sorry, there's no redemption for you. Once you're dead, you're dead. When you end up in hell, you're going to stay in hell. So what do we learn in this passage about life after death? and the situation of those who actually are in hell. See, one thing a lot of people don't realize, the people that go to hell, the dead are still alive. Both Lazarus and the rich man survived their own funerals. Their spirit, their soul, their personality, their mind, their thinking, it was still there. See, the dead retain their personalities, and the dead retain their essential character. Lazarus is still Lazarus, and the rich man is still the rich man, even though they're in two different places. Even in hell, the rich man could see, he could hear, he could feel, he could recognize. Even in hell, the rich man could remember and he could speak, he could reflect, he could plead, he could suffer, and he could think ahead that I'm stuck here. See, there was only one thing that the rich man in hell couldn't do. He couldn't get himself out of hell. And he was a rich man. There was no deals. His money didn't help him. See, death marks the final separation between the saved and the lost. And this isn't always an easy concept to teach about or preach about. But once in heaven, you're always in heaven. But once in hell, you're always in hell. You're not going to bargain your way out. You're not going to be Lucy and Ricky. There's some splaining to do. And, you know, I'm going to talk to God about this. He ain't listening. Once you end up in hell, you're in hell for eternity. And um, no one can pass from heaven to hell or from hell to heaven. And hell is a place of personal suffering. You will suffer eternally, hour after hour, day after day, month after month. You know, an amazing grace we sing when we've been there for 10,000 years and think about the glory of what it's like to be with God in paradise forever. 
What about the opposite? When we've been in hell for 10,000 years, suffering and torment day after day after day for 10,000 years. See, the damned cry for help, but in hell the help never comes. None of the rich man's prayers were answered nor could any of the rich man's prayers even be answered. I think you could preach a useful sermon from this text on this topic. What people in hell know. Consider what the rich man knew. See, once you get to hell, you wish you weren't there. But it's too late. So if there was a sermon, what the people in hell know... Consider the things that the rich man knew after the fact. He knew that there was no way out for him. Period. He knew his brothers could avoid hell if they repented. And thirdly, he knew that someone needed to warn them about the danger that they were in facing hell. Here in a case, here's a case where a man in hell has more evangelistic fervor than some Christians on earth. I want to tell my brothers, I want to, he probably thought after his brothers, he probably was close to his brothers. I want to warn them so they don't end up where I'm at. And then he probably thought about the rest of his family and friends. I, I got to tell them, I got to figure out how to connect with them, but it's too late. See, is hell for real? If the words of Jesus are taken at face value, the answer has to be yes. See, if you take the words of Jesus at face value, heaven's real and so is hell real. So, in recent years, there's been a growing debate in Christian evangelical circles and some well-respected Bible scholars, they've argued in favor of annihilationism. It's the view that at some point after death, the unsaved are um, um, redeemed by God and they just simply are incinerated because of the flames of hell and then they simply just cease to exist. It's argued that annihilationism is, is far preferable to the traditional view of hell because the traditional view of hell, it's a place of eternal torment decades and decades and centuries and so on. But some say that the doctrine of eternal hell is immortal and makes God look vindictive. But once again, our only source of information is this. What does the Word of God teach? What does the Word of God tell us? Here are some of the biblical words and phrases associated with hell. Smoke, fire, burning, torment, a bottomless pit, everlasting prison, wrath, weeping, wailing, gnashing teeth, unquenchable fire, eternal fire, the second death, damnation, the, the furnace of fire, blackness and darkness, and burning sulfur. These images and symbols do not sound like um, inhalation to me. Consider what... Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew 25, 46 says, Then they, the unrighteous, will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. There's only two options. See, in, in Matthew 25, 46, it's very clear. They, the righteous, will go away, the unrighteous, rather, will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. In the Greek, the same word for eternal is used in both clauses. Eternal life is truly unending. It stands to reason that eternal punishment and eternal life mean the same thing, eternal. In Mark chapter 9, verses 48, excuse me, in Mark 9, verses 47 and 48, Jesus offers a very graphic description of hell. Jesus himself speaking says, and if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where 
The worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. So, he says, if your eye bothers you, you should pluck it out. See, a lot of us play with sin. You know, we don't think sexual sin's a big deal. We don't think lying's a big deal. We don't think stealing's a big deal. We don't think anything's a big deal. We don't, you know, God didn't pull out his AK-47 and, and blast me today, so that's not a big sin. He didn't pull out his heavenly taser and, and zap me. Yeah, I got away with it. I don't think anybody knows. He does. God knows. God knows every single thing you do. And you know what? He's got the best high-definition films. And someday on Judgment Day, he'll play those films back for you your whole life. Every single sin. Every single thing you did. Um, you think, I go to Costco, and they got these 90-inch televisions, and they got these pictures like they jump off the screen, and I'm like, well, I don't have a television that I watch, so... I don't have a TV, so it's like TV's not a big thing to me. But I mean, you go to Costco and they have these 100-inch screens and they're only like about 1500 bucks, relatively cheap. When they first came out, they were like 10000 yeah. And so now they're down to about 1500 bucks for the greatest and latest TV. And I mean, the picture is just amazing. And um, you know, God will show you the story of your life someday on a screen just like that. But think about what Jesus said here. He says that the worm does not die. The concept of the worm comes from the burning trash dump called Gehenna in the Hinnon Valley outside of Jerusalem where the trash was. While the fire burned around the clock, so did the worms crawling through the decaying garbage and refuge and it never seemed to die. The worm speaks of the internal torment of the guilt-ridden conscience and of the evil desires that can never be satisfied, while the fire speaks of the eternal torment of hell. In the book of Revelation, chapter 14, starting at verse 9 through uh, verse 11, this should also be considered in this regard, because here it says that a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on the hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full of strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day and night for those who worship the beast or his image or can anyone who receives the mark in his name. So for those young people that like to sleep a lot, hell has no rest. You ain't going to sleep. You ain't going to get a comfy blanket. You ain't going to stay in the bed till noon. You're going to be awake 24-7, tormented day and night. That's what the Bible teaches. I mean, if that's not a wake-up call, I don't know what's a wake-up call. Think about this. There's no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast or his image or anyone who receives the mark of his name. Those who follow the beast, the Antichrist, they'll be tormented for all eternity. These verses seem incomparable compatible with the whole idea that, you know, there's some inhalation or, you know, we just get wiped out at some point. Finally, we should know Revelation 20, verse 15. It said, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. See, when you become a Christian, when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, when you are a true son or daughter of Jesus, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And if your name is not in the book, you're as good as going to hell for all eternity. 
The verse describes the final destination of the unsaved dead. At the great white throne judgment, they are resurrected and given their final sentence of damnation. They are cast into the lake of fire. I don't know anybody that wants that particular um, ending. But when all said and done, there seems no reason to abandon the traditional view that hell is a place of eternal torment. And <clears throat> I don't take any joy in saying that because it means that some people are going to suffer for all eternity. There's some people in this building today that are going straight to hell. There's no joy in that. Even if we don't completely understand it, and no one on earth fully has a full grasp of eternal hell or eternal heaven, we must be true to what the Bible actually teaches. You know, that's why I spend so much time on this book. If we don't know God's word, we'll believe and fall for anything. Another thing is, you know, why is hell even necessary? You know, with this question, um, it comes down to the bottom line. Of what use is the doctrine of hell? Some Christians shy away from the doctrine of hell because they think it distracts from the message of the gospel. This is unfortunate because hell serves actually many purposes. First, it provides a foundation for civic virtue. Most of us have heard that, you know, there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. The doctrine of hell promotes right living because it teaches us that our actions have consequences. Our choices have consequences. See, we live in America. We think, well, I could just pretty much do anything. As long as I don't get caught, I'm good. You know, and as long as they don't have my fingerprints on that stuff, you know, as long as I can get away with it, you know, I'll do whatever I want. You know, I was, it was funny. A couple years ago, I was at Meyer, and I walked in the first set of doors, and all of a sudden, I heard all the doors go, lock. So now I'm in between the, the inside doors and the outside doors, stuck, you know, in the lobby. And I'm thinking, oh boy. Well, there was a guy that, yelling and screaming, <clears throat> he stole stuff from the store, they tackled them. They had them on the ground. And they said, sir, just stand over there to the side. You know, we got to, we're going to cuff, the, the one guy says, we're going to cuff this guy. And then when the cops come, the cops will put their cuffs on them and take them away. And, um, you know, this guy, they're pulling stuff out of his pockets that he stole. I didn't steal anything. You guys planted that stuff on me. Huh? I mean... <laughs> You're in the lobby of the store, and it's all loaded in your coat pockets. But he didn't steal anything. You know, so not only do we steal, but then we lie about what we do, and it just gets worse and worse. <coughs> um, don't worry about what it says in the book of Revelation. You know, liars go to hell. Ouch. You know, because some people think, you know, I mean, in America, politicians lie. Lying is a national pastime. You know, if I can lie and get away with it, you know, and then we tell 16 more lies to cover the first lie. And then we tell another 15 more lies to cover the first 16 lies. You know how it goes. But, I mean, technically, I mean, the, the concept of hell should provide virtue in our lives. Thinking, I want to be good. You know, if we sin with impunity in this life then in the next life, we'll pay heavily for our misdeeds. Most people don't realize that. In the ultimate analysis, without God, there's no pers per persuasive reason to be good. I mean, if there's no God, there's no reason that we should be good. You know, why would we live a life to please God if there is no God? If there is no God, we just live a life that I can do anything. All things are, are permissible. Without, without a God, I mean, without God, you know, you know, there's no consequences. Don't have to worry about it. You know, don't uh, have to worry about it at all. But if we want moral renewal 
and God knows this nation needs moral renewal, you know, we must recapture the concept that some things are right and other things are wrong. But the Bible tells us in the last days we'll call evil good and good evil. That's the life we live now. Things, when I was a kid, just 30 or, well, 45 years ago. 45 years ago, I would have been 15 years old. You know, half the nonsense that you see today, it didn't exist then. When I was a kid, there was never a school shooting. Never, ever. School shootings never existed in America when I was a kid. You know, all the evil, you know, same-sex marriage and all this other nonsense, abortion, killing 63 million babies. That, that only started in 73, legally. And now they don't call it murder or abortion. Let's call it reproductive freedom. What freedom does the baby have? The baby gets murdered. And he's the innocent party. Separate heart, separate mind, separate hands, separate feet, separate body, different blood type than the mother. But it's my body, my choice. Well, the body that's in you isn't your choice because the choice should have been made when you sleep around, before you sleep around, knowing what the consequences are. Once you create life, that life inside of you has a heartbeat within the first 10 weeks. A real heart True. that beats independent of the mother. So it's not your body, your choice. It's a separate body, a different body. It's a body that's inside of your body. Yeah. But, you know, we just say all kinds of stupid stuff to justify our sinfulness. But, I mean, I spoke about this just the other day. The Ten Commandments are written in the walls of the same court that says the Ten Commandments shouldn't be in a public place in America. But it's written on the walls of the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Above the justices' heads are inscribed the Ten Commandments. But the same court says you can't have Ten Commandments in a public place. You can't have a Bible in a public place. You can't have, you know, they, uh, the, the U.S. military ruled at one of their military hospitals that they had to get rid of all Bibles because people found Bible's offensive. You can have the Quran, but you can't have a Bible in one of the military hospitals. I just read about that a couple weeks ago. How crazy is that? I mean, we're getting more and more godless every single day. We tolerate other religions, but Christianity got to snuff that out. They threw Bibles out of school. They threw prayer out of school. And look at the mess we have in our schools. See, if we really understand stood this, we'd return to the ancient principles of reward and punishment. Truth is grounded in God. Morality is grounded in God. Justice is grounded in God. You know, the other funny thing is, if you go to, um, if you go to the great uh, rotunda in Washington, you know who the center statue is in the Great Rotunda? It's not a president, it's Moses, the lawgiver. And all the other statues face him. And then they say, well, this wasn't a Christian country. That's, you know, we, we've, we've thrown God out of everything and we believe what we want to believe. But to this day, Moses is the center statue in the Great Rotunda in Washington, D.C. Moses, the lawgiver. He's the first guy that had a tablet, by the way. Matter of fact, he had two. But, um, you know, if there is no God, then there's no heaven, there's no hell, and there's simply no reason to be moral. Think about this. In the end, people will go to hell because they deserve to go to hell. They will be there, not by mistake, they will be there on purpose. Nobody's going to fall into hell by accident. If you end up in hell, it's because the way you lived and because of the choices that you've made. That's why you'll end up in hell. And hell also provides final justice. See, people go to court and they argue with the judge. I didn't do it. And even if I did, I got overcharged. You know, I only did half of what they were 
blaming me on doing. Well, in the final justice, God's the great arbiter. He's the final judge. See, we need hell in order to right the wrongs of this life. Because some people that should have been in prison never went to prison. Other people that went to prison shouldn't have been in prison. And hell will be the final place to right the wrongs of this life. What about pornographers who have ruined so many lives and marriages? What about drug dealers who corrupted so many people because of them selling drugs? What about husbands and wives who walk out on their families, walk out on their spouses? What about politicians who abuse their power and get rich off the misery of other people? What about the monstrous criminals who have killed children? What about the abortionists who've murdered countless babies? How can any earthly punishment repay them for what they did? So many crimes go unpunished while the perpetrators are let go. The perpetrators who hurt so many people, they get off scot-free. And because of this, I think God realized that hell must exist, if for no other reason but to balance the scales of final justice. And also, hell is a place that uh, sinners can go. You know, once you've rejected Christ, you would never be happy in heaven anyways. What would drug pushers do in heaven? What would greedy slumlords do in heaven? I mean, what would evil people do in heaven? What would unforgiven sinners, um, they'd just be miserable in heaven. It would be like hell and paradise. And also, hell, hell helps the saints on earth. Actually, the doctrine of hell reminds believers of the great salvation that they can receive in Christ. When we remember that we were on our way to hell, we must stop and marvel at God's free grace. And the awesome reality of hell ought to motivate us to win our family and friends and our loved ones to Christ. Hell also protects the saints in heaven. Imagine heaven with saints and unregenerate sinners intermingled. The sinners would be angry and the saints would be frustrated. Where is the reward for serving God if everybody made it to heaven? There would be no reward if everybody made it. And what kind of heaven would it be if the bank robbers living side by side to the serial killer and next to Mother Teresa, all in the same block? See, heaven would be like earth if that was the case. If all the people were just mixed up together. And then another thing that hell does is it demonstrates the greatness of our God. If we don't find ways to fully see it right now, the reality of hell will make manifest God's glory in the ages to come. See, hell proves that God is both holy and just and that he truly does keep his word. We know from a literal heaven, a real heaven, and a real hell, a literal hell, that God keeps his word. I believe the saints will one day praise the Lord as he judges sinners and that all his ways are right and all of his ways are absolutely true. Occasionally someone will ask me, you know, is the fire of hell real or is it just symbolic? The answer is, of course, yes. It's yes in the real sense that there is something that corresponds to fire and brimstone in hell. And yes, it's symbolic in that it's a non-consuming fire that burns in total darkness. Typical of those who favor a, a real literal interpretation is the quotation from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great London pastor in the 19th century. He says this, there is a real fire in hell as truly as you have a real body. A fire exactly like the one which we have on earth, except this. It will not consume you, though it will torture you. 
You have seen asbestos lying amid hot red coals, but not consumed. So your body will be prepared by God in such a way that it will burn forever without being consumed, with your nerves laid raw by the searing flame, yet you'll be desensitized for all its raging fury. The acrid smoke and the sulfurous fumes searing your lungs, choking your breath, you will cry out mercy, but you'll never see mercy because no mercy will ever come once you're in hell. So you'll cry out for mercy, no mercy will come, Quotations like this actually could be multiplied from older authors. Modern day theologian R.C. Sproul says that the images of fire and brimstone are symbolic in the sense that they point to something else. However, in this case, the reality must be greater than the symbol, not less. He suggests that whatever hell is, it's so terrible that the people would pray for literal fire and brimstone instead. And I think that all puts this in proper perspective. They would like to just be consumed and killed instead of just tortured by the fire that rages on forever. Several hundred years ago, there was a French philosopher, Pascal. He put forth his famous wager regarding the Christian faith. It's an imaginary conversation between a Christian and a non-believer, and it goes like this. Suppose that atheism is right and Christianity is wrong. In the end... I've lost nothing by believing in Christ since my faith gives me hope and comfort in this life and the atheist has gained nothing because he believes that death ends it all. But suppose that Christianity is right and the atheist is wrong. Who wins and who loses? The Christian wins everything because the Christian goes to heaven. The atheist loses everything because the atheist goes straight to hell. So if we're wrong, we lose nothing at all. If we're right, we go to heaven. But those who reject Christ, they run that terrible risk that hell is real. And because it is, that's the only place they'll end up, going straight to hell. Each person who hears these words, they must make an intelligent decision, an informed decision about heaven and hell. If what I've said is true, then... You must do whatever it takes to make sure that you go to heaven and you must do whatever it takes at all costs to make sure that you do not go to hell. And let's go back one more time to the words of Jesus Christ himself because I want to make sure that his words are clear. When Thomas in John 14, the Gospel of John chapter 14 when the Apostle Thomas asked him the way to heaven, Jesus gave this answer, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, 6. It's the same words that are on the sign outside. And that's one of the strong doctrinal points of our church. The way to heaven is narrow. The way to heaven is so narrow, it's, as narrow as the cross. Only those who trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord will enter the gates of heaven. There's two truths I know about myself with complete certainty. First, I ought to go to hell because that is where I belong. In a thousand ways, over 10,000 days, I have sinned against God in word and deed, I deserve his punishment because my sins are great. But the second truth is greater than the first. I'm going to heaven because Jesus Christ went to hell on a cross for me. You see, Jesus paid the price. He took my punishment so I could go free. Let me say it this clearly. You don't have to go to hell. God has provided a way of escape for you. But even God's way of escape will not do unless you reach out and you take it. If you ignore Jesus, then there's no hope for you. God doesn't have a plan B for those who reject his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The application of this sermon is easy and clear. 
We should be quick to believe all that the Bible says. And we should not be ashamed to declare the hard truth, even when the word does not, the, the world does not want to hear the word that God has provided. If we believe that hell is real, should that not motivate us to earnestly seek salvation, not only for ourselves, but to show the road of salvation to the others around us? How selfish it, it would be for you to have the good news and just to keep it for yourself. And to those tonight that don't know Jesus, I pose the simple question, why should you die in your sins? Why go to hell when Jesus has opened the door to heaven? It does not require a decision to go to hell. And even God can't take you to heaven if you have hell in your heart. So the question is this, what must I do to go to heaven? The answer comes back, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. What must I do to go to hell? Here's the shocking answer. Nothing. You don't have to do nothing at all. You can go straight to hell and just do nothing. If you do nothing about your soul, hell is where you'll go. Do nothing and you'll be lost. Trust Jesus and you'll be saved. May all those who hear these words be rescued from hell and one day arrive safely in heaven through the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Father, I pray. Father, open minds and hearts. Give them a realization that heaven and hell are both real. It doesn't take a decision to go to hell. By doing nothing, we can end up there. But it takes a conscious choice to make it to heaven. That's receiving and accepting Jesus as our Savior. So Lord, I just pray that everybody this night who doesn't know him, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, it's my absolute hope and desire. I implore all those who are going the wrong way, living the wrong way, doing things the wrong way, that you would open their eyes to see Jesus so that they could spend eternity with him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.